Um, I'm going to first of all like to invite uh, our regional president of Ahmadiyya Muslim Community Scotland to come and chair the event. It's uh, Mr. Abdullah Ghaffar Abid Sahib. Please join us. Thank you. Um, second, I would like to invite uh, Imam Ataul Momin Saab, who is uh, a professor at <coughs> Ahmadiyya Machinery College in London, and uh, I would like uh, I'm I'm welcoming them very much on our guest panel. He has traveled from London today. Uh, he was actually here yesterday, but uh, joining us first time here in Edinburgh. So I welcome him very much on our guest panel. Um, secondly, I would like to invite uh, Chief Inspector Gavin Phillip. The Gavin Phillip uh, is, has joined Lothian and Border Police in 1987 after having extensive experience in different police units he was transferred to the Safer Community Department at headquarters Edinburgh in 2009. There he took a lead role in developing the force preventative approach before being promoted to the role of head of the force diversity unit. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, then I would like to invite uh, Dr. Sabdi, who is chairman of uh, the Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'i Community in Edinburgh. She has an extensive experience in conducting courses, seminars, lectures on different aspects of global governance, in particular health, gender issues, and world order. She is currently working as consultant pediatrician at uh, Royal Hospital for Sikid, and she is also an honorary senior clinical lecturer at the University of Edinburgh. Thank you, Sabdi, for joining us. And I would like to invite Mark Solomon, who is rabbi for the Edinburgh liberal Jewish community, and uh, he has a deep commitment to interfaith dialogues. Rabbi Solomon is co-chair of the London Society of Jewish and Christianity and the Interfaith Alliance UK. He is also chairperson of the Scriptural Reasoning Society as well. And uh, uh, I welcome you on our guest panel and thank you so much for coming. And um, our next guest speaker is Rev. Brian Cooper. And uh, Brian is a retired Baptist minister. He was very much involved in uh, Coventry City and Cathedral International Peace and Friendship Links and was for the chair of the British Christian Peace Conference for over 20 years. Currently, he is working as Interfaith Secretary for Uniting for Peace, which is an international NGO devoted to create and promote a global culture of peace. Uh, thank you, Brian, for joining us today. Thank you very much. And uh, now I would like uh, our chairman, Mr. Abdul Ghaffar Abisab, to start the proceeding of uh, the event. Thank you. And yeah, sorry, um, I just want to invite one more our guest. It's uh, Dr. Ijazur Rahman who has joined us from the London. He is Vice President of Ansarullah UK Elderly Group. And uh, I'd like uh, to thank him for coming all the way from London. Thank you very much. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا يسخر قوم من قوم عسى أن يكونوا خيرا منهم 
ഫുസുമ ജസ്സുലയോ ഹുഹിബുഹദുഹിമൈത്തൻ ഇലിത്തു ഫോർട്ടിനോട്ടിവ്സ്ലേഷൻ Happily that they may be better than they nor let one group of women deride other women happily that they may be better than they and do not defame your people nor call one another by nicknames it is an evil thing to be called by bad names after having believed and those who repent not such are the wrong doers o you o ye who believe avoid much suspicion for some suspicion is sin and spy not on one another neither backbite one another would any of you like to eat the flesh of his dead brother surely you would loathe it and fear god surely god is oft returning with compassion and is merciful o mankind we have created you from a male and a female and we have made you tribes and subtribes that you may come to know one another verily the most honorable among you in the sight of god is he who is most righteous surely god is all knowing all aware on the behalf of amdia muslim community it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you all on our first edinburgh peace conference i am deeply moved by the fact that today some of you have come from long way uh, london aberdeen dundee and uh, glasgow as well Uh, some of the guests who are not present here today due to being out of country have sent their uh, really warm wishes to all the attendees and our distinguished uh, guests and speakers as well uh, including them in mr david martin who is a member of european parliament and uh, he have uh, sincerely apologized for not being here today because he is in japan at the moment um second is our right honorable alister darling he has also confirmed that he won't be here in edinburgh today so uh, unfortunately we don't have him here and i would like to thank them uh, dear guests in past few decades united kingdom has welcomed people from around the world and has become 
a land of multicultural society. As a part of this integrated society, we have a great opportunity to learn and practice good value from each other and live side by side peacefully in our day to day life. Today, this event is very much like that opportunity to meet and hear from our various faith group representative as to how their respective tradition and religious scriptures inspire them to work for societal peace. This event is uh, going to start with the sp uh, speaks from our guest speakers and then going to end with the question and session from audience. Any question you like to ask? And once again, thank you very much for joining us today. All the distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, peace and blessings of God be upon you. As you know, this gathering has been organized by the Ahmadiyya Muslim Association of Edinburgh. Some of our guests may not be familiar with the community, therefore I feel it appropriate to say a few words for the sake of introduction. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community was founded by Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, peace be upon him, in 1889, who claimed under divine guidance that he was the reformer expected in the latter days by all major religions. On the first day, 40 people were initiated into the community. The number continued growing and today it has its branches in 199 countries of the world with 200 million adherents spanning all the continents. The UK chapter was established in 1913 and it now has more than 90 branches. Its members are law abiding, peaceful, hardworking and benevolent citizens all over the world. On the demise of its founder in 1908, this work was his work was carried out, carried on by his elected successors, called caliphs or khalifas. The present khalifa, fifth in succession, is Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmad, who was elected to this esteemed office in April 2003. His official title is Khalifa al Masih the fifth. Under the blessed institution of Khilafat, the community has a distinct sense of unity and purpose, a factor that enables it to serve God and mankind with sincerity, sacrifice, and devotion. Ahmadiyya Muslim community built its, its first mosque in London in 1924. This was the first ever purpose-built mosque in London and is known as the London Mosque. Qaeda's Muhammad al Jinnah also spoke at this mosque in the early 30s before returning to India in 1934. In 2003, the community opened in south of London, one of the largest mosques in Europe. According to the newspaper The Independent, it is one of the top 50 modern buildings in the world. In 1994, the community started its own TV channel known as MTA, that is Muslim Television Ahmadiyya, using a network of four satellites. MTA International broadcasts globally 24 hours a day in eight languages simultaneously. In the field of education and knowledge, the community has produced a number of persons of international ranking. Just to name one, Professor Abdul Salam, who won the Nobel Prize in Theoretical Physics. He was invited by the Edinburgh City Council to become the first medalist 
at the first uh, science festival in 1988. You will find his name on one of the walls of the city chambers. One of the main tasks of the community is to help in establishing a global peace, which is the topic of this afternoon's gathering. The community believes that peace will remain a dream as long as each nation considers its political and national interests above all others. According to the program, the learned speakers will express their views on this subject. I close this introduction with the community's motto, love for all, hated for none. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As introduced, my name's Gavin Phillip. I'm a Chief Inspector within Lothian and Borders Police, and I work at the Safer Communities Department at Force Headquarters at FETES. Um, my thank you, though, is on behalf of the Chief Constable um, for inviting us along today, and congratulations to yourselves for uh, bringing together such a diverse audience. Uh, you know, that really is genuine with regard to that. Um, I've had quite a thought when you're only speaking for 10 minutes and there's a lot to cover, it's, uh, it's important that you hopefully get the right message. And I was changing my notes right up to the last minute there, so hopefully I've uh, just picking up on one or two things. But one of the first things I wrote down is, is what is diversity um, in terms of the police? My, my main role is uh, really encouraging all the different areas within Lothian and Borders Police and all the different uh, police officers and staff who make up uh, Lothian and Borders Police, which is over 3,000 officers and uh, about half the number of police staff, really to make sure that our service within Lothian and Borders Police is genuinely for all communities. Uh, and that, that, that's a big challenge with regard to it, to try and have that consistent message of re regard to it, and that the police very much is for all communities. And I was just writing down there what my own thoughts are in terms of what diversity was and, and what I believed it to be. And a lot of it is really from the heart, and it's, it's, it's what you actually believe in. And uh, this, this desire really to serve all communities is, is very strong, certainly within myself. And I hope and I, I believe that uh, is strong within all the officers that's, that serve within the communities. And that last part is very important. You know, these officers are within the communities. They stay within the communities, generally within Lothian and Borders, and they serve the community. It's your, it's your police service. And again, I think that is very important. I joked in terms of forcibly removing me. Um, but it's a police service, it's not a police force, it's there to serve, to assist, uh, sometimes under difficult and challenging times like we're at at the moment, I would suggest. Um, my role in terms of that, I suppose, promotion of, of well-being, um, really a big part of it is encouraging engagement and that's why events like today are so important to actually meet different people and to listen to different people. Yes, at the moment I'm doing the speaking but I'll be listening to what's said and I'll be considering that in terms of our whole approaches and trying to understand some of the issues that concern people within this room and the communities they represent. What I've loved about my job over the last um, 18 months that I've been in it in particular is it's really given me the opportunity to learn about different communities. And again, I was jotting down some examples of some of the challenges within communities. I've been at uh, incidents and I've... Uh, hopefully be able to provide assistance to people from the gypsy traveller community um, for quite serious issues and uh, some which wouldn't appear so serious but have a real impact on people's lives and for that reason it's very, very important that we take it seriously. Quite a number of, of, victim, of, of crimes and incidents where the victims have been gay and really quite horrendous stories of abuse from people who have disabilities and people who suffer from mental health. But probably the, the biggest... Um, uh, concern and the biggest issues have been around race and faith with regard to that. And that, uh, that I've found a big, big challenge because my knowledge in terms of all the different communities is, uh, is, is developing, but I really rely very, very heavily on people like yourselves um, because in terms of the different communities that you're part of, that you serve, you have a far greater knowledge than myself. So I'm very, very keen to learn with regard to that and to share that, that level of knowledge with, with the officers. I think the fundamental one, and we have it actually in our force vision and values, is that everyone we come into contact with matters. And whether that's people within communities, whether that's people we work with within Lothian and Borders Police, if we stick to that principle, I don't think we'll go far wrong uh, with regard to it, although I appreciate it's, uh, it's quite hard achieving that. 
A big part as well for me is, is building trust and confidence within communities. If people within different communities trust Lothian Borders Police and the officers and staff and what we stand for, then not only will they report issues of concern to them, which will allow us to hopefully impact on it and make it a safer society for everyone, but they'll also report things where the conduct of other people within communities is not acceptable, because I genuinely believe that the vast majority of people within communities uh, stand for the right principles. They don't want people within these communities who are committing crime, who are committing things which will impact on, on the well-being of communities. And I think, again, that is very, very important. I said challenging times. Um, there's quite a number of international issues which I think a lot of people will be aware of that will impact on local communities. And we have to be aware of that and we have to think through that in terms of how we, we best deal with that and, again, uh, allow people to be protected and safe in their communities. But we've also got the challenges nearer to home, the financial position um, that not just Lothian and Borders Police are under and other public authorities, but I would suggest society as a whole. That brings its challenges to us where there's less money available in society, there's less money available available to the police and there's difficult choices to be made. But for me it's absolutely critical that we don't allow that to dilute the impact on our engagement with communities because if we do that, that would be very much a false economy. It's nice saying in public that we protect the front line so that you see visible police officers there in your communities. But a lot of times, quite often, the more important work is actually done behind the scenes, you know, done by officers like the two officers that are in the audience today, whose, whose role is very much to build up that engagement with communities. And that's a long-term investment with regard to it. And an example recently for me is um, the Scottish Defence League and English Defence League, which some of you may be aware about what they stand for in that debate probably for another day. They visited Edinburgh for the second time over the last 18 months. And I think it would be fair to say within a lot of communities that visit uh, had particular concern and, uh, and, and real issues for them. What we did, I suppose, in response to that is that, that we went out and worked with communities, tried to understand those concerns and put in interventions to, to mitigate the tension. But that doesn't just start on the visit of the Scottish Defence League in the, the four or five weeks beforehand. That's done on a day-to-day -day basis by having um, officers um, who communities recognise visible contact at, at mosques, at places of worship, and throughout communities. People that they trust have confidence in, and they know that if they raise issues with those officers, they'll deal with them very, very seriously. And that long-term investment needs to continue. The benefit of it is, 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 is absolutely appropriate. But we also need to make sure within our own uh, police service that our police service is representative of communities. Um, at the moment, in terms of, of uh, BME officers, it probably reflects less than 2 per cent, and that's, that's a failing as far as I'm concerned. We, we speak about a diverse Scotland, and I think we do have a diverse Scotland, a government that's, uh, and politicians that are very proud of a diverse Scotland. We need to mirror that in terms of our police force and make sure that uh, people in, in communities see officers and staff representative of those, those communities. Again, that's a long-term thing, but that's certainly something that we would intend to work towards with regard to it. Um, and I think the very, very important thing, just to, to finish off and before I get thrown off the stage, is really making sure that we continue that community contact. We're very fortunate. Uh, we work closely with a number of organisations. I think one of them represented here today, the Edinburgh Interfaith Association. Um, they have given us some fantastic advice, assistance. They've also been a critical friend as well, sometimes where they think that we're not getting it right or we're potentially um, doing things which would have a negative impact on, on communities. They will challenge us and we absolutely welcome that. But if you look back to not that long ago, the visit of the Pope to Edinburgh and to Scotland, they again provided us with, with some great uh, advice and assistance there. And, and that's mirrored throughout uh, the various communities we, that we work with. That's very much a whistle-stop tour. Uh, I'll be available for the rest of the day. I hope it's a, a helpful introduction, but an absolute commitment to events such as this and to working with your community. Thank you very much. So Baha'is believe that uh, all men, that, and women, that is, that's generic men, all human beings, all men, have been created to carry forward an ever-advancing civilization. Baha'is believe that humanity 
is evolving. It is going through a process of, of evolution as we have done so from right beyond, from millions of years ago, from before even uh, written historical record. Our written historical record is only about six to 8,000 years of age. Beyond that, we have no records of what really happened, but we do not know that human beings existed and that we are going through a process of both social and at the same time, spiritual evolution. We are growing, we are progressing all the time. Next, please. Keep going. And Baha'is believe that this is the time that, uh, next, that, uh, that uh, divine, in fact, they believe that in this process of evolution, this process of, um, of progress has been actuated, it has been galvanized and stimulated by divine revelation, by the phenomenon of divine revelation. And in fact, Baha'u'llah says, Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith, he says that um, there can be no doubt whatever, and it's a very emphatic statement really, and it's in common with all the religions, but this is a, a recent version of it. There can be no doubt whatever that the peoples of the world of whatever race or religion derive their inspiration from one heavenly source and are the subjects of one God. So if you want to doubt that concept, you're a loser, I'm afraid, because there, there can be no doubt whatever that we really all derive our inspiration from one heavenly source. And that is the absolute basic principle from which we have to start. Next, please. And Baha'is believe, therefore, that this process of divine revelation, which has come to humanity through a succession of spiritual luminaries or prophets or messengers or avatars, or whatever you want to call these, these individuals, you know, humanity's educators, the educators of humanity's collective evolution, that uh, th these have been the galvanizing forces behind the civilizing of human nature behind the civilizing of human societies. And this process, Baha'is believe, has had no beginning and it has no end. In the Quran also, it's, it mentions the fact that there are something like 23,000 prophets that have existed. But we only know of the recent few from the last sort of six or 7,000 years. So Baha'is believe that this process of um, revelation has and will, is and will be the driving force for our evolution, for our progress. Next. And uh, what is common with all of these religions is that they are the only forces, they are the ones that have taught us how to behave in a decent way. So we don't get into trouble with the police whose inspectors sitting us here, right? So it's the religions that have taught us how to behave. They have taught us the basic principles of decent human behavior. And of course, the golden rule that underlies all of them is that you should treat others as you wish to be treated yourself. And we don't have time, otherwise I had nice pictures showing of all the different religions and verses from the uh, different scriptures, whether they were from 6,000 years ago or 100 years ago, saying exactly the same thing in slightly different terminology. But this is basically that you, the principle of justice, of moderation, our judicial systems, a balanced society and a civilized one, right, is based on this principle of golden rule. When people behave, when people act according to this principle, then we have justice, then we have peace. If we break this rule, right, in any way, then we have injustice, we have unbalance, we have lack of harmony, we have conflict and war. Next. So it's not surprising, therefore, there, there it is. That's just the summary of the golden rule, but uh, I had big slides of all the pictures. Next. Of all the religions saying the same thing. And then, of course, the religions have also taught, taught us rules of personal behavior. So, for example, I bring the five Buddhist precepts because they're nice and concise. You know, don't kill, don't, uh, what is it, don't steal, don't indulge in sexual misconduct of all sorts, so adultery and, and all the aberrations of human nature from that front are, are uh, included in this. Don't lie, make false speech, and don't take intoxicants that cloud the mind, alcohol, drugs, all of these things. And you know, inspector and our police officers and everybody else, that, you know, crime is so much over 90% of crime is related to taking intoxicants that cloud the mind. And all the religions, irrespective of their place of birth, have, uh, have taught us against the use of these chemicals that, that cloud our judgment and therefore allow us to, be, to behave in an animalistic way and in a way that's, that's uh, not in consonance with our wonderful human nature. Next. 
And so uh, this is, yes, next. So if we look at our world and the history of our world, we find, for example, the Hindu civilization has come into being as a result of the revelation of Krishna and a series of the Hindu avatars next. We have the Persian civilization next. Um, and the first charter of human rights uh, that was brought about as a result of the direct inspiration of Zoroaster, you know, the, the Persian uh, messenger of God next. Then we have even Greeks, uh, the Greek Empire and Rome was established as a direct inspiration of the prophets of the House of Israel, of course, next, and there is more and more evidence. And you have the Buddhist civilization as a result of the, you know, the revelation of the Buddha, next. And the Christian civilization, this is an example from, uh, from Russia, of course, and next. And of course, the, the greatest and the uh, closest to our own time is that of the Islamic civilization. This is a school believe it or not, in Samarkand. Fancy going to a school like this. You know, whereas before there was nothing, there was just the nomads and so on, then Islam brought this amazing uh, efflorescence of, uh, of knowledge and learning and sciences and arts and so on. So this is where uh, the closest to our, ourselves. Next. And then when we forget the golden rule, when we forget those basic precepts, what happens? Civilizations fall. Okay, so this is the ruins of the Persian civilization. Next. And then we have the Ruins of the Roman Empire and the Greek Empire, even though they were so great and they were democratic and everything else. Next, I know I've got only three, four minutes. But basically, Baha'is believe that true loss is for him whose days have been spent in utter ignorance of his self. So therefore, knowledge of oneself and, uh, and how to, uh, to relate to others is absolutely fundamental. Next, quickly. We're all losers if we forget. Next, next, next. Yes, next. And so Baha'is believe that, that, that um, this process has a purpose. And uh, as you can see from, the, from, the, uh, from Isaiah, the greatest of the Jewish Old Testament prophets, and all the other scriptures have promised a time when there will be universal peace established in the world, all of them. Isaiah, for example, says, and I'm sure you know this off by heart, I, uh, you know, there shall come to pass, he says in the last days, that uh, swords will be beaten into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. So the instruments of destruction, which are bound today, Will be, will be transformed into instruments of construction. That nation shall not rise against nation, and men shall not learn war anymore, and he shall wipe away all tears. So this is just one example of, of the promise of all the religions that the time for universal peace, for harmony, for the establishment of, uh, of oneness of the human race will come. And you know what? Baha'is believe the time has come. This is the great news. This is the glad tidings. This is the time. And this is the fact that we are actually creating this conference like this is a very positive evidence and a sign of the fact that the time is now, that we are living in the time when next, next the establishment of, um, of peace is, an, is not only possible but inevitable. Yeah, next. Next. I don't have time to go through this, but this is really Baha'u'llah's teachings. When he said in his letter to Queen Victoria... Um, in his summons to Queen Victoria, he said, regard the world as a human body. So therefore, all the principles of the Baha'i faith are geared, and, um, geared towards and designed to promote and to establish that peace together with everybody else on the planet. Next. And uh, so Baha'is believe peace is not only possible, but inevitable. And in fact, Baha'u'llah says that he who is your Lord, the all-merciful, in other words, God, right? cherisheth in his heart, next, the desire of beholding the entire human race as one soul and one body. And you know, when God wants something, he's going to make sure it happens, okay? With, of course, you know, we have to rise to the challenge and help that happen. It's not going to happen magically. We have to build it from the bottom, yes, from the grassroots, next. And so some of the Baha'i principles embody and serve the purpose of priest promotion. Oneness of God, oneness of religion, as we mentioned, oneness of humankind, the equality of the rights of men and women. And friends, I need to just emphasize this because it is very, very, very central that, uh, in fact, the Baha'i writings suggest that the greatest factor in the establishment of universal peace and international arbitration is women. Because when women arise and they will form a mass opinion against war, then there can be no war. When they don't want their children, their sons, their husbands, their brothers, their fathers to go to war for serving some kind of silly, stupid, blind prejudice, okay? 
then there can be no war. And so the education of women and girls, as it's been, uh, uh, as it's been proven now also scientifically in many, many research projects around the world, when children and particularly girls are given priority in education and certainly at least receive the same rights as the boy in terms of education, then the interclimate, the psychological climate will emerge whereby peace uh, will emerge and war and conflict will not be resorted to as a means of, of uh, uh, fighting, uh, of solving uh, disagreements. Next, please. Equality of abolition of prejudice of all kinds, yes? Next. Universal compulsory education for each child and boy, uh, of girl and boy. Harmony of science and religion. Next. Universal auxiliary language to be taught in all the schools of the world in addition to your mother tongue so people can communicate. And I know I'm nearly finished. And uh, uh, extremes, elimination of extremes of wealth and poverty, etc. Next. Just we need, need to go to the next one, etc. Next. So, what are we actually doing physically? Right. C practically, what are the Baha'is doing the world over? First of all, we, um, as one of the core activities in, in Baha'i communities everywhere in the around the world, and this is one from India, they are organizing devotional meetings where, in fact, what is happening is that uh, individuals become conscious of their spiritual beings and they're open to everybody of all faiths and none. So it doesn't really matter where you come from and what background you are. And therefore, uh, when we come in contact with our spiritual beings, we become uh, better human beings. Next. What else do we do? Yes. Uh, then what they do is that they teach children's classes. We teach children's classes open, open to all. In Green Bank, where I'm living, for example, we've got a children's class where there's a Muslim, there's a Hindu, there's a Christian, there's a Catholic, well, cr Protestant Christian, Catholic, and several other people who, um, who join. So be because that helps to, again, abolish prejudices and create unity between people. And the children, if they're grown up they, without prejudice, they will not resort to war and fighting. Next. Then junior youth, sorry, the top bit hasn't come, but come in, but it's basically for the junior youth, the teenagers. We have special spiritual empowerment classes for teenagers to harness their efforts and their energies into construction rather than destruction and getting asbos. Um, they will, uh, they will c contribute to the betterment of society. Next. And then this is again, sorry, it's study circles, it's above, uh, it's gone above, but study circles to study the word of God and to study the different religions together. And again, that helps, that sort of learning empowers human being, beings to do uh, good. Next. And then we'll, I'll, um, they promote the arts next. Yes, yeah, so promoting the arts and establishing peace. And we also engage in public discourse, yes. Um, so, for example, this is the uh, Prince Philip and one of the Baha'i representatives, you know, talking about uh, peace promotion, environmental uh, problems, etc. Next. And uh, quickly, quickly, I think we have, we have to go. And engagement in social action. As you can see, there's uh, Nelson Mandela and several other people of different faiths, including Baha'is. Thank you very much. I'm most honored as the rabbi of the Edinburgh Liberal Jewish Community to be invited to be here with you today for this important conference and also to be here with uh, the chairman of our community, Professor Gillian Raab. I'm going to begin by speaking a little bit about the idea of peace and its importance in Jewish tradition and then some ideas about how to promote peace within our society. Uh, it's a very special time of our Jewish year right now. Yesterday we had Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the holiest day in our Jewish calendar when we fast and uh, repent for our sins and pray for forgiveness. It's a day of reconciliation within ourselves, between ourselves and God, within our communities. And then just four days later comes the festival of Sukkot, tabernacles, when we build little harvest booths out of leaves as a symbol of what we call the Sukkot Shalom, God's shelter of peace. And we pray every day in our prayers, may God's shelter of peace come to shelter us and all the world. And in fact, when the Edinburgh Liberal Jewish Community was formed about 10 years ago, 
They chose the name Sukkot Shalom as the Hebrew name of the community, the shelter of peace. And uh, I was interested to find that our liberal Jewish community here in Edinburgh numbers 70 to 80 members, which I think is more or less a similar size to the Ahmadiyya community. So in a way, we're brother-sister communities. Um, and of course, there is also the Orthodox Jewish community, which is about twice the size of us here in Edinburgh. Judaism teaches that shalom, the word for peace, is in fact one of the names of God. God is shalom, is peace. But what does the word shalom mean? And of course, Muslims will recognize that it is similar, it is related to the word salam. Shalom doesn't just mean peace in the sense of an absence of conflict. It means a sense of wholeness, of completeness, of integrity. It's in fact the same word for healing and for health. Without peace, a society is a sick society. Making peace is to bring health and wholeness. And of course, the very nature of wholeness means that nobody can be left out. Peace between you and me, if we're leaving him or her out, is not real peace. It has to include everyone in order to be true peace, in order to reflect the wholeness and holiness of God. And of course, as in Islam, where salam is the greeting one gives, the same in Hebrew. Shalom is the way we say hello or goodbye and extend the greeting of peace. And our Talmud, our ancient rabbinic sacred writings after the Bible, praise the greatest of the rabbis, the greatest of the ancient sages, as being the ones who would be the first to offer shalom, to extend a greeting of peace to anyone they met out in the street or the marketplace. The greater the rabbi, the, the more ready they would be to say shalom, not just to a fellow Jew or a fellow rabbi, but to anyone they encountered, high or low, Jewish or non-Jewish. The sign of a true spiritual person is to offer shalom to everyone without exception. Of course, this is the ideal. Now, one of the greatest of those rabbis, his name was Hillel, he lived almost exactly 2,000 years ago. And we have many beautiful sayings by Hillel. Um, most famous is when someone asked him to define, to teach him Judaism while he stood on one leg, yeah, which you might think is impossible, Hillel said, no, that's fine. What you hate, do not do to anybody else. That is the whole Torah, the whole of Judaism, the rest is just commentary, but you've got to go and study it. Okay. And another saying of Hillel, very beautiful saying, the first of his sayings given in our main collection of the sayings of the rabbis is, be of the disciples of Aaron, loving peace and pursuing peace, loving all your fellow creatures and drawing them near to God's teaching. You don't just love peace, as the psalm says, you have to pursue it. You have to make every effort, every compromise in order to create peace. You don't just wait for it to come. And why does he mention Aaron, Harun, in the Quran? Harun, uh, the brother of Musa, the brother of Moses. Because in our tradition, Aaron was the great peacemaker. Moses was laying down the law. Yeah, Aaron was there with the gentle word of peace. And the Talmud says, if two people were, you know, were, were quarreling, would not speak to one another in the, in, the, in, the, in the Israelite camp, Aaron would go to one of them and he'd sit with him and he'd say, you know, your brother there is so upset that he's fighting with you. He's so sorry about what he did to create this fight. He really wants to be at peace with you, but he couldn't come and say it himself. Yeah. Then he'd go to the other person and sit with him and say, you know, your brother there is so upset that he's quarreling with you and he's so sorry for what he did to create this fight. And he can't say it himself, but he wants to make peace with you. And what would happen the next time the two people passed in the, in the, in the street, they would embrace one another and make peace because they believed that that is what they both wanted. And this actually indicates another little teaching because there are many great values. We're told truth is the seal of God. Truth, of course, is important, and we're told to tell the truth. 
But when it comes to making peace, you're allowed to bend the truth a little bit, yeah? Yeah, you, it's more important to make peace, even if you have to occasionally not tell the entire truth. And I think that's an important, uh, important lesson. Uh, so we're told, who is the true hero? Who is the true gibor, the strong person? That is the person who can make an enemy into a friend. Okay, these are all lovely ideals and stories, but how is one to do it in practice? Well, a few brief ideas. Our tradition tells us, as Jews living for most of our history as a minority within wider communities, that one of the important principles, you know, we have our own Jewish laws, but we're told by the great sage Samuel in the third century, Dina de Malchuta Dina, the law of the land is the law. Yeah? You can have your own religious law within your community, but to live with others in a wider community, you need to respect and honor the law of the land that makes everybody equal, that puts everyone on an even basis in that community. This is one of the central principles, I think, that has helped Jews to live as a minority in so many different cultures throughout the last 2,000 years. But more than that, one of the rabbis tells us you should always pray for the well-being, the shalom, the shalom, the peace, the well-being of the government. Because without the fear of the government, people would swallow one another alive. So, you know, we know human nature contains an element of conflict. Inevitably, conflict and clashes arise. You need strong government and you need to pray for the government. That is to respect it in order to create peace. And... Uh, and I think praying for the government, of course, on a spiritual level is good, but it implies you need to do all you can to support the government in creating that level playing field, a space of peace, of equality, of justice for all in the ways that Chief Inspector Philip has outlined for us. But you have to go more further than that. We all have to do our bit. And here the principle in Judaism, we call tzedakah. It's a little bit like zakat in Islam. Um, and it's related to sadiq as well, tzedakah, meaning righteousness, justice. But in practice, it means giving charity. It means supporting others. To make peace, if somebody else is in need, uh, is impossible. And, and I think our speakers have said that already. So we need to support those, not only within our community, but beyond. On our Day of Atonement is the time, above all, when we think about charity, and the community chooses a number of charities to support in the coming year. And yesterday, Professor Rab announced for us our charities for this year, which includes some Jewish charities, looking after those within our community, but also the Scottish Refugee Council, for instance, supporting those who are driven to come to this country because they're unsafe in their own countries. Water Aid, which supports uh, clean water, drinkable water, and the eradication of disease in many parts of the world, including the subcontinent, of course. And then one needs to go even deeper than that. One needs to recognize the value of the diversity of our religions and cultures, and to come to appreciate the positive gifts. I think it's important to see, as, uh, as Dr. Terry said, the inspiration of God within every religion, and appreciate that while we have our own riches, we can become even richer spiritually by seeing how God has inspired others and studying their teachings. And Judaism has certainly learned so much from Islam, among other religions, in its history. Many wonderful teachings. Of course, the Quran tells us God could have created us all the same, but God chose to make us different communities to learn from one another and to see who can do the most good. So this is uh, the competition God has given us, which is a wonderful teaching. Above all, we have to recognize the what we call the image of God, the likeness of God in every other person. Every human being has a spark of the divine. When you look at another person, you have to see someone of infinite value. Only with that attitude can you truly love your neighbor as yourself and create peace. Uh, 
You, you, Dr. Terry, already took that verse from Isaiah, which I was going to mention. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Because it's a messianic hope, but we all have to do our bit to bring it a little closer in our world. And anyone who is not seeking peace, and I include any government in the world, including the governments in the Middle East, including Israel, who is not actively seeking peace, and making compromises for peace is not doing God's work. All must seek peace and pursue it. Thank you very much. I wanted to make some comments about the teaching of Jesus and then to talk about some aspects of the present situation globally. In this Sermon on the Mount, which is recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, Jesus gave 11 categories of those who are blessed in the sight of God. These included, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, verse 8. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And among these special categories are the categories of peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. In other words, those who are devoted to overcoming conflicts and making peace between people's individuals and communities are blessed of God and especially close to him. If we ask why should this be so, it is because the Christian and also the Muslim and Jewish grand pictures speak of humanity dwelling in a garden of Eden in peace and harmony with each other, with nature and with God. And therefore we understand from the beginning of Holy Scripture that God's purpose for humanity is peace and harmony. This historically has been frustrated by human rebellion against God, expressed, among other ways, in wars and in conflicts. Jesus, Jesus was saying that those who strive to achieve God's peaceful purposes for humanity are blessed and are God's children. In the same sermon, he declared a concept truly revolutionary for his own time. In verse 44, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be the sons, the children of your heavenly Father. And this, in my understanding, put aside previous primitive understandings of God as a warrior deity fighting for particular chosen people. Now, Jesus in his time historically was speaking to his fellow Jews. Now, Jews did not hate fellow Jews. So obviously he was talking about the Jews in relation to the Romans under whose occupation they were living and in many ways were, were oppressed. Jesus did not support guerrilla warfare against the Romans. Also, it's significant that Jesus acceded to the wishes of the Roman centurion who was the officer of the occupying power to heal his servant. He could have said, no, you're an officer of the occupying power. Why should I help you? But he, he reached out to him. So Jesus was a, a reconciler in the whole of his life and of his ministry. And I understand him at one level, because Jesus, we see him at many, many levels, but at one level he was a revolutionary, or radical revolutionary preacher of, of love, of nonviolence, of peace and reconciliation. And very significantly, this, was, this reconciliation aspect was very understood uh, by the early church because the early church contained a very wide diversity of people. And the Apostle Paul records that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither the Jew, the Gentile, male or female, slave or free. These divisions were broken down in the early church and there were to be a sign to the rest of humanity that humanity, that all the diversities, were to come together in, in that single community. And it must be said, the Christian church down the centuries has had a very, very mixed record in how far it has really obeyed the injunctions and the example of Jesus. On the one hand, uh, after the Emperor Constantine became the Emperor, uh, Christians on the whole generally ceased being pacifist, as they had been before, many were martyred for that, and they did engage in warfare and the church was constantly trying to limit warfare, pre 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 prevent warfare. 
the medieval papacy was constantly engaging in diplomacy to stop wars between Christian states. There were great peace movements in, in the Middle Ages, and the Pope, in fact, tried to issued the fact that the edict banning the crossbow didn't work, but in fact it was an attempt to, to limit what was then a, a weapon of mass destruction uh, in the Middle Ages. But yeah, I think it is to the great tragedy that down the centuries the, uh, the countries most influenced and affected by the Christian faith did not take the Jesus peace message seriously enough. One had the awful tragedy of the First World War, mostly by European nations, or nominally Christian, fighting each other so very, very terribly. If we come to today, I think the emphasis uh, in, the, in Christian churches uh, would be very much on the building of peace through uh, building a just society, both within societies, and also particularly on the global scale, so that one, Christians tend to, like others who have spoken today, see the causes of conflict and war rooted in the, the social causes, for example, the extremes of wealth and poverty, uh, the, 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 the lack of essentials of life, the lack of food, lack of shelter, lack of water. And, you know, tonight, about one-sixth of the world's population will go to bed hungry at the same time as $1.6 billion are spent every year, half by the United States, on the wars and military. And we think of the Horn of Africa today alone, 12 and a half million people are in danger of starving to death. This shows a real a lack of, of proper perspective, lack of proper sense of priorities as to how the world should be spending its resources. So one would very much, as a Christian, want to support the United Nations Millennium Development Goals for education, for health, for shelter, um, for the building, for all the basic building blocks of a peaceful uh, global community. I think it's very, very important that the world faiths come together, um, not just something for Christians or Muslims or Jews or Bible, but we must do this as united uh, groups of the various faiths and to affirm these priorities for humanity. Earlier this year, I helped organize in Edinburgh an important Christian Muslim inter interfaith peace meeting at which um, a very senior figure on the interfaith scene, um, Reverend Dr. Marcus Braybrook, an Anglican churchman, president of the World Congress of Faiths, um, said these words, and I'm going to quote at some length, but I think this is a very significant quotation. It certainly sums up my own feelings too. While religion is seldom the primary cause of conflict, all too often religious differences inflame hostility partly because religion is so bound up with identity. Although both Christianity and Islam are religions of peace, their scriptures have often been used or misused to justify violence and aggression. Christians have too often betrayed Jesus' call to the way of nonviolence, preferring the theories of the just war. What is clear is that killing in the name of God is blasphemy. The world religious leaders call at the Millennium World Peace Summit of the United Nations for the non-violent resolution of conflicts must be constantly stressed, along with commitment by people of all faiths to help build a culture of peace, starting with recognizing the sacredness of the other. The faith communities should take specific measures towards building a more peaceful world. They should give a lead by ridding themselves of the suspicion, the hostility, and competitiveness so often shown between faiths. They must preach the message of human unity, challenge false nationalisms, and encourage support for international law. The faiths need to champion the poor, oppose the arms trade, and seek a new moral world order based upon a shared global ethic and engage more strongly and consistently in practical peace-building efforts. And Dr. Braybrook emphasized the importance of religious non-governmental organizations at the United Nations. They often take the lead in speaking out against human rights abuses, the spiraling arms trade, the widespread use of torture, and recently been particularly active in trying to extend the ban on cluster bombs. By such means, people of faith have a major preventative role in helping move 
remove the causes of conflict. So from the Christian point of view, I believe that trying to apply Jesus' timeless principles of reconciliation and peace, we can try and do this on the global scale by undertaking these kind of activities, not just as one faith community, but together. Thank you very much. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh amma ba'du fa a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim most worthy chairman respected elders dear sisters and brothers it's an enormous honor for me that I'm given the opportunity to address this august assembly today. The teachings of the Holy Quran and uh, the establishment of world peace. It's a topic which is very challenging in its nature, uh, not because it is very hard to prove that uh, Islam is a religion of peace or the teachings of the Holy Quran ensure peace in almost every sphere of human interest and aspiration, but because of the fact that uh, this holy book, the Holy Quran, the sacred scripture of, of Muslims, is always unfairly maligned to be the scripture uh, which promotes hatred and terrorism. And uh, it is actually quite contrary to what the Holy Quran has actually taught. Um, for most of the listeners, today, uh, it would be very interesting to know this paradox that uh, the very scripture which is uh, thought to be promoting hatred and terror in the world founded a religion uh, named Islam, the very meaning of which is peace through submission to the will of Allah. And in this single word, Islam, all the teachings and attitudes of the Holy Quran are most beautifully and concisely reflected. And uh, one who becomes a true Muslim, he not only enters a safe haven himself, but he also guarantees it for others. Because the Holy Prophet of Islam, Hazrat Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, described a Muslim as one uh, who, who, who causes no harm to others through his tongue or uh, through his word or deed. So. Uh, According to the teachings of Islam, a true Muslim is the one who, who apprehends no harms to others in any way. And in the contemporary world that suffers from countless um, such factors and maladies which uh, are responsible uh, for, for disturbing the world peace like violence, bloodshed, conflicts, wars and violation of human rights, Islam is the religion which has uh, uh, given such teachings regarding the establishment of world peace which are so elaborate and detailed that they guarantee peace at all levels and all spheres of human interest. Uh, may, may they be um, individual, social, economic, national and international. Um, first and foremost, I'll explain the role of the Holy Quran for the establishment of interreligious peace. For a religion to be helpful in establishing peace, it is absolutely necessary that it accepts the universality of, uh, of religion. Uh, Dr. Tahiri also made a reference to that. So uh, according to the teachings of uh, the Holy Quran, uh, the divine authority which sent his prophets uh, in one area of the world, uh, it has also sent to other parts of the world. So Islam accepts the universality of prophethood and religion by saying, وَلَكَدْ بَاسْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةِ الرَّسُولًا أَنَيْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَجْتَنِبُ التَّاغُودِ That we did raise among every people a messenger with the teaching, worship Allah and shun the evil one. And the Holy Prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, has told very clearly in the Holy Quran that you are a bearer of glad tidings and as a warner, we have sent you as uh, a bearer of glad tidings and as a warner, and there is no people to whom a warner has not been sent. Chapter 34, verses 24 and 25. So in view of the above, it is manifestly clear 
that uh, Islam does not monopolize the truth to the elimination of all other religions. Rather, it accepts the universality of prophethood. Now, for example, a Jew may look down, down upon uh, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, or, um, or, 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 or a Christian uh, may not accept the prophethood of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, or, or a Hindu, for example, may regard all of them as, uh, uh, as, as imposters. But a Muslim leaves the pale of Islam the moment he fails to accept the, the prophethood of all these prophets. So a Muslim is the one who accepts the prophethood of, of, of all these prophets. And regarding the establishment of interreligious peace, uh, the question of the attainment of salvation is also very important. Uh, of course, it is the, the right of every religion to say that, uh, or, or to claim that uh, the one who wants to attain, attain salvation, he should enter the safe haven of that religion. Uh, but unfortunately, um, the clergy of different uh, religion actually present a, a different view. They, they, they are very rigid and not non-tolerant in this regard. And they would say that, that only the adherents of their respective religion will enter heaven or paradise of God. But Islam has presented a totally contrary view. It says that, uh, very clearly states in the Holy Quran, God says that surely those who have believed in Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the Jews, and the Sabians, and the Christians, whoso believe in Allah and the last day, and does good deeds, on them shall come no fear, nor shall they grieve. So the Holy Quran accepts that uh, uh, the adherents of all the religions, if they are doing good deeds, they have their due reward with God, and they will not be denied that. So I, I have one or two other references uh, explaining the same thing. So this uh, misunderstanding that according to Islam, um, all Jews or Christians or adherents of other religions are hellbound is totally false um, in the light of what I've just recited before you from the Holy Quran. And uh, it is very important to note in this regard that uh, the Holy Quran does not permit the use of force um, as an instrument for the spread of its message. And it is very clearly stated, it is chapter number 2, verse 257, that there should be no compulsion in religion. Surely, right has become distinct from the wrong. So according to the teachings of the Holy Quran, there is no need for any coercion. Thus, uh, to profess, to practice, to propagate, to exercise, or to denounce one's religion, uh, or to change it for, is altogether a matter of choice and a Muslim is not allowed to use force or coercion in such matters. Now I'll go for the teachings of the Holy Quran for providing social peace in the contemporary society. Um, the, the modern world suffers from countless social maladies uh, like exploitation, duplicity, hypocrisy, and so and so forth. They can be counted in hundreds. Uh, the Holy Quran has actually provided us with uh, a list of do's and don'ts uh, which are necessary for the establishment of uh, social peace. Uh, the do's also run in hundreds. They can be like preserving chastity, cleanliness, controlling anger, cooperation, courage, doing good, enjoining good and forbidding evil, forgiveness, giving of true evidence, gratefulness, humility, and so and so forth. And, and the don'ts of the Holy Quran can also be counted as uh, in hundreds. I, I have the references of all those uh, with me, like um, uh, committing adultery or arrogance or backbiting or telling lies or theft or murder or robbery. Everything is mentioned in the Holy Quran. And I, I, I admit that the central core of uh, this teaching is common to almost all religions. So I, I'll go for some, some distinctive features of Islam to which ensure social peace. Uh, for example, in this connection, uh, first of all, I'll mention Islamic teaching regarding murder and the shedding of the innocent blood of someone, 
God very clearly says in the Holy Quran, whosoever killed a person, unless it be for killing a person or for creating disorder in the land, it shall be as if he had killed all mankind, and whoso gave life to one, it shall be as if he had given life to all mankind. Chapter 5, verse 33. Uh, now you can see uh, that according to the teachings of uh, the Holy Quran, the taking of a single life is like the massacre of thousands of people. And giving life to a single life is as if you have given life to all humanity. So this is the teaching of Islam. In the presence of such teaching, uh, all those misconceptions which are raised about Islam, like it is, it is a religion which promotes terrorism, or it is a religion which teaches suicide bombing or stuff, can be easily removed. Uh, again, I'll mention in this regard the, the rights of women. Uh, we all know that uh, the, the Arabian Peninsula, Peninsula was probably the most notorious in this regard by giving uh, women their, their due rights. And even today, probably, we don't find, find those countries giving pr proper um, rights to women. But the teaching of the Holy Quran is very clear in this regard. It, it clearly says, it is chapter number 2, verse 229. It says that they, the women, have rights similar and equal to those of men over them in equity. And this is very clear, I mean, that, that women has equally the same rights as, as men have. And it is chapter 2, verse 229. Two, Thus, there is total equality and there is no difference whatsoever between the fundamental human rights of women and men. Again, Islam is the first ever religion to give women rights of inheritance. In the Holy Quran, daughters are given rights of inheritance from their parents and wives have a, have a right of inheritance on husband's inheritance and mothers have also been given, given rights on their children's inheritance. So the Holy Quran is very unique in this regard and uh, it, probably it is the only scripture which, which gives women the rights of inheritance. Again, uh, I would talk about racism, which is also one of uh, those social maladies which mar world peace. Uh, and uh, the, according to the teachings of the Holy Quran, I would refer to the verse which was recited in the beginning, which clearly says that the most honored among you is the one who is the most righteous. On, uh, otherwise, all humans are equal. So uh, the Holy Quran in, in this way has eliminated ra racism from its very roots. Um, in the end, I, I know I have very little, little time left, um, I would uh, refer to the Islamic teachings regarding the establishment of economic peace. Um, uh, in the first place, I should mention the rights of inheritance which the Holy Quran has provided. In the second place, I would say that uh, the institution of zakat which is established in Islam that is a kind of uh, a money which is taken from the wealthy and given to the poor. Islam has uh, in this way provided for the discharge of uh, all those rights that the poor have in the wealth of uh, the rich. And uh, the concept of interest as we all know has also played havoc with the economic peace of many households and uh, even, even governments are suffering from the, 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 this, this actually uh, malady. The prohibition of interest is, uh, this is, is central to the economic philosophy of Islam. Allah loves beneficence towards human beings. So if, according to the teachings of Islam, if someone is in real need of, of help, he should be helped on the basis of humanity. Uh, no interest should be taken from him. Again, uh, in the, in the end, in the, in the last part, I would, I would mention the Islamic teaching regarding the establishment of international, international peace. For the settlement of uh, international disputes, uh, the, the, verse of, the following verse of the Holy Quran is very pertinent. It says, and if two parties of believers fight against each other, make peace between them, then if after that one of them transgresses upon, against the other, fight the party that transgresses. So it is almost the same thing which uh, nowadays UNO, or, or UNO does, but the Holy Quran 
um, has very clearly stated another thing which is very important in this regard. It's, it says that then if it returns, make peace between them with equity and act justly. So, uh, uh, of course, if, if someone is trying to disturb the peace of the world by attacking some other nation, we can stop him uh, according to the commandment of God mentioned in this verse. But uh, the, the Holy Quran very clearly states that you must act justly in such situations. So if he, if he returns from his, uh, from his earlier behavior, so there, there's no room left for suppressing him more and more for no reason. Uh, the last thing which I would want to say is that the individual peace, the peace of an individual according to the teachings of uh, the Holy Quran, the true peace of heart uh, according to the teachings of the Holy Quran lies in turning towards God. And uh, uh, just the teachings of the Holy Quran say in principle that just as a salmon fish cannot find peace until it re returns to the place of it, its origin. It, it returns to its spawning ground, grounds. Similarly, human heart cannot find peace without spiritually returning to its source of creation, and that is God. Uh, and, and it is said in the Holy Quran, it is only in the remembrance of Allah that, that human hearts can find peace. Chapter 13, verse 29. Thank you very much. Um, uh, peace, salam, shalom to uh, all distinguished people in the room. Um, my name's Lisa. Uh, I work with Shakti Women's Aid uh, in Edinburgh. Um, uh, to quickly frame my question before I ask it, just to make sure people know, uh, Shakti is a women's aid organisation based in Edinburgh. We uh, specifically support black minority ethnic women, children and young people, both male and female, who are f affected by domestic abuse. Uh, the name Shakti might give people the idea that we are a Hindu organisation, we are not. We uh, are of uh, multi-faiths and uh, of no faith as well. We have women who are of all faiths and we support uh, women and families uh, who again are from many different faith backgrounds and ethnicities. Um, I, uh, as well as supporting women as well, we do also work in conjunction with people like Respect in London who support men who are affected by domestic abuse and also with the White Ribbon Campaign uh, in Scotland and in the UK who uh, is run by men to uh, face what we all recognise as actually quite a gender-based problem, uh, even though it does affect men uh, globally from 85 to 95 percent of all victims of violence uh, uh, in terms of intimate partner violence and family violence is very often women um, uh, in all sorts of ways. Um, I think it's very important, and thank you to Ahmed as well for pointing out, um, you know, uh, important uh, points to uh, looking at equality for women, because I do believe, however, that while we have uh, um, uh, important speakers, uh, uh, Baha'i uh, women speaking earlier on about the rights of women and, and a number of the speakers mentioning about the need for equality, true equality, that can be realised through these faiths. However, whilst for, for, for a lot of people that is something that's alive in their hearts, we still find a shakti anyway that um, a number of the abusers, and I will f point to them and their behaviour, uh, uh, are of many faiths that, ha that are represented here today, uh, that they read these same words, but to them they are just words on paper. They have not uh, become something that they are actually living in terms of, of, of peace. And, and, and this is people who are from uh, Islamic faith, from Sikh faith, from Christianity, uh, from Baha'i, from uh, Judaism, all sorts of different faiths. And these are people as well who are not often, but at times are actually quite in influential places within those faiths. And I think it's important for me to, to say that. So, like the White Ribbon Campaign, who are actively asking men to recognise domestic abuse and violence against women, not as a women's problem, but potentially as a men's problem, because this is men's violence we talk about, to actively do something, as well as just highlight things on pieces of paper, what 
uh, can and will your different faiths do to get men to actively show their commitment to eradicating violence against women? First, first of all, I would uh, like to appreciate the, the wonderful work which you are practically doing to stop people from um, discriminating other other races or for example for the women right women's right which you are doing and at the second place uh, the religion has given us proper teachings uh, in all such i mean to to avoid all such situations where practically people do not actually um, regard other races as as equal to them or they do not uh, regard women's right as uh, as something which is necessary Practically, what we need to do is, in, 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 in the modern world, to, to observe the teachings which are given by God to different religions, and then to practice them properly, and to exhort each other to, to, to practically establish the teaching which is given by God. I have mentioned that uh, the Holy Quran and the teachings of Islam are very clear regarding the, the rights of women. And I've also mentioned that um, the Holy Quran in no way uh, accepts the idea of, uh, of discrimination between races by saying that uh, uh, the most honored among you is the most righteous. Uh, otherwise, uh, the Holy Quran states that uh, we have created you from a single male and female. And uh, the, only dif the differences between races were given uh, just for, the easy rec for, for easy recognition. So this is the teaching which, which religion has given. Now practically it is the duty of we, uh, the, 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 the people who are actually living in this world, to abide by the teachings given by God and to, to try to alleviate such as this, the situation where we are living, the, the society where we are living. Thank you very much. I think you, it, it's a very pertinent question and you ask specifically what can be done, obviously. As a, as, as a student of social sciences myself, I think most of this violence and these issues arise, have, have got more of a cultural background to it rather than any religious connotation and that must be understood. And education, I think, right from a young age is the answer to eliminate all such things. I think it's important that um Certainly all Christians should remember that Jesus gave a remarkable uh, expression of equality to women in his own time. And while the apostles or disciples, the twelve, uh, were all men, there were many other close female figures around him. The Bible records it was the women who stayed by at the foot of the cross with Jesus when he was put to death. The men mostly fled. And it was very significant in the record of the rising of Jesus from the dead on Easter morning, the first person he met in his risen body was Mary Magdalene, a woman. And this in, in many ways was quite revolutionary in those days. And Jesus also reached out to women of other communities, which was really quite um, unacceptable normally in the society, polite society of that time. And I think if the church down the centuries has sometimes given women a secondary place, that has been very, very wrong. But I think significantly in, in more recent times there's been a complete uh, reevaluation of this. Um, it's interesting that the most the significant controversy in the Church of England, not my own church, my Church of England, is whether women should become bishops. And um, this is, of course, be a huge step forward in the Anglican community, because most churches now recognize and have large numbers of women ministers. So I think the women's equality issue is now um, pretty well accepted in the Christian churches. And as far as the issue that you've mentioned, there are a number of programs, both ecumenically by different by churches together, and also by national church groups to overcome uh, domestic violence. I think this is now taken extremely seriously, and also, which you might have mentioned also, the, the trafficking of women for prostitution. This is now taken mm -hmm. very seriously and the considerable campaigns by the churches to tackle that problem. Uh, how careful a husband has to be uh, to treat his wife, to love his wife as himself, to treat, to honour her more than himself. And one could quote many such sentences. Of course, there were the aims. But we know uh, human beings being what they are, every community contains households which are troubled. 
the temptation, of course, is, especially in minority communities, to sweep it under the carpet, to say, it's not our community, it's another community, or if it is in our community, to try and deal with it internally. I come back to the idea the law of the land is the law. In all our communities, if we're aware of problems, we need to be have the courage to say this needs to be dealt with by the law of the land and we have laws to deal with domestic abuse. Um, and uh, of course every religion as I say contains noble precepts but all of our religions coming from ancient times uh, come from societies that were filled with inequality. That is the reality, whatever the precepts say. So all of our religions and cultures need reforming. Uh, and I think, you know, in Judaism, there is a process of reform going on, uh, focused very largely on the equality of men and women. This needs to be accepted and expanded. But I want to c give you a little story as well about domestic abuse, which could work both ways, men to women or women to men. There's a story in the Talmud about a Roman matron who was having a conversation with Rabbi Joshua. And she said to the rabbi, she said, you say that your God created the world in six days, but what's he been doing ever since? And Rabbi Joshua said, he's been making matches between men and women. She said, but that doesn't take all of time. I can do that easily. She called 50 male slaves, 50 female slaves. She said, you marry you, you marry you, you marry you, and sent them off. The next morning, she called Rabbi Joshua again. She said, now I realize I was wrong because this morning when all the slaves came out, one had a broken arm and one had a bashed head and one had a black eye. Yeah, maybe God does need to do, spend all that time making matches between people. Um, I think the question of the question, um, the lady was, uh, how, what are your communities doing exactly to practically to establish, um, bring, sort of put into practice the, these wonderful precepts about the establishment of equality of rights of men and women. From a Baha'i point of view, on, a, um, on an international level, there has been the establishment of the Office for the Advancement of Women. Um, and also they have a seat at the United Nations and um, the Baha'i international community, which has consultative status with the United Nations, has actually helped in bringing about the process, the several conferences that have taken place around the world for the advancement of women. And, and they're trying to work quite hard with people of different backgrounds and both secular and religious organizations around the world to promote the well-being and also the education, as was mentioned very, very significantly by our speaker on the on the left, to um, give priority. Priority has to be given to the education of the girl child, because that's been shown again in research work that if you, in fact, it was a bishop in Kenya who said, train a man and you train an individual, train a woman and you build a nation, because the mothers are the f the first educators of the children, and if they're not educated, the children are brought up not only poorly nourished and in poor physical health, but also with a whole lot of prejudices and lack of self-confidence and lack of the ability to even articulate their desires and their wishes. So I think it's very important that that emphasis on education was placed by our um, panel speaker, and this is what the Baha'is are, are trying to achieve, and also by encouraging women to take a lead in all sorts of um, community activities. They are elected onto their locally and nationally and internationally elected bodies and you know they are doing most of the work in fact of, of promoting <laughs> these principles. So and, and also of course um, mothers bring up their children without prejudice and with respect. They bring their hopefully their sons up to be gentlemen rather than being, uh, <laughs> being aggressive and so on. So this sort, sort of aggression has to, has to be removed. Um, from the face of the earth, really, and from families. I mentioned the importance of our police service being representative of all parts of the community, and that includes the gender mix as well. 1987, when I joined, uh, I was five at the time, I should add. Um, uh, uh, there was uh, 95 women on my, oh, sorry, 95 people on my course at the Scottish Police College. Five were women. I don't know what percentage that is, but certainly very low. Um, we're now, in terms of police officers, looking at around about 30% of the organisation and 50% of new recruits. <laughs> it's progress, but there's still a long way to come. 
um, very few women in senior positions within the organisation and in certain parts of the organisation not at all and we need to do some more work in terms of understanding the reasons why that is uh, with regard to it. In terms of some of the wider issues, um, there's, there's legislation I think has you know developed in certain areas around forced marriage but legislation for me is only part of it. It's actually building that trust and confidence words that I mentioned earlier on around um, people reporting various bits and pieces you know in terms of honour based violence, uh, female genital mutilation and, and the like and also very importantly raising awareness of our own staff with regard to it I think historically and, and arguably presently it's, it's argued as a problem elsewhere uh, an English problem. Well, it's here. It's 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 within this society. It's within communities. But I think we are fortunate. The deputy chief constable of the force, Mr. Allen, uh, previously led nationally uh, throughout the UK in terms of honour-based violence. So we're in a we're in a strong position to take that forward with regard to it. And I suppose just a comment on violence overall. Um, I think it has been a priority for the service for quite a number of years. But for a long number of years, it was probably the external uh, violence uh, with regard to. Um, probably a lot linked to alcohol in terms of street violence, if you like. I think we've we've now recognised over the last few years that the internal part, you know, the stuff that happens behind closed doors is just as important to impact upon. And um, if you look at uh, publicity in terms of the, the football, the old firm matches, you know, the, 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 the increase in terms of domestic violence when, when significant sporting events are on and the like. And, you know, that's not just a problem in the west of Scotland. That's an issue here as well. So um, a lot going on, a lot of challenges with regard to we uh, practically give them a very high status. Within our own uh, organization, we have got a separate wing for the uh, ladies as well, so that they can have uh, their uh, own activities, uh, you know, and programs as well. And we fully support them in, in, in that, so that they can develop fully, you know. Uh, according to the Islamic teachings, uh, some, sometimes the people misunderstand the concept of equality in Islam regarding the role of man and the woman. Because Islam, you know, stresses uh, the roles of the woman different than the man. Because it's, it's a different biology, you know, because a man cannot give birth to a child. So they cannot be equal in that respect, you know. So it is the woman who has got more important role to play. Not, not that she is not equal, she has got more important role to play. So in the uh, outside life from the house, the man has to play the, that role. See, you know, in, in the Western world, we all realize that because of the pressures, most of the time, the woman has to also, you know, take part into the economic activities and go out and work and bring some money in. This uh, in is Islam doesn't uh, put pressure you know, on the shoulder of the woman in this regard. Islam puts this burden on the shoulder of the man, that it is his duty to feed the children and the woman and the, uh, bring the, uh, enough money, make an effort. So, so, so in, in a way, Islam has tried to put uh, the foundations, the strong foundations, so that the woman can look after the children properly, educate them properly, and not that she is absent, you know, and the children are being uh, neglected. Uh, I have got uh, a recent, uh, you know, the information. Uh, I am a member of a Rotary Club in Kirkintalach, and one of the speakers was uh, a head teacher from a local uh, high school. And she described the problems which she is facing every day. And most of these problems were emerging from those families, which are the single, uh, you know, the parent families. And, and the mothers, uh, because they have to go out and, uh, you know, work, and they were neglecting the children. So their Islam, uh, you know, and its teaching uh, are more relevant and bringing the balance in the society. That the main responsibility of uh, going out and working and bringing the money is not on the shoulder of the woman, it is on the shoulder of the man. And, but with the passage of the time, when the children are grown up, there is no restriction on the woman that she cannot work and participate uh, in the activities. Um, the father um, rightly said that I think the major issue now that we've got in the Church of Scotland is the fact that can a lady actually be a priest? That is the major issue that it seems to be having now. Now, in the part of Islam, I think if I know fully well, women are not allowed to be, be priests. Is it not a way of basically undermining them or basically saying they are 
second-hand people, or is it equal right here? And then to the Baha'i um, scholar, the question there is, um, are ladies actually allowed to be leaders in terms of maybe imams, or I don't know how the terminology you use in the Baha'i faith. Thank you. So the answer to that is easy, because there is no clergy in the Baha'i faith. So our affairs are conducted by democratically elected institutions, local and national, and then there's an internationally elected body. So, um, and then there are appointed individuals such as councillors and what we call board members who, are, who have an appointed council, role of counselling basically the communities. And um, so uh, there is no clergy in the Baha'i faith. And uh, women and men are equally eligible to be above the age of 21 are equally eligible to be elected unto these institutions or appointed? Uh, the answer to your question uh, would be this, that uh, yes, a woman can be the imam uh, in, in Islamic teachings, uh, but only in, in the condition when she has m m all the congregation consisting of women. Uh, but if men are included in the congregation, she cannot be the imam uh, according to the teachings of Islam. But the reason is very simple. Actually, in, in the Islamic way of offering the prayers, the Imam actually stands in, in front of the whole congregation and uh, the prayer is offered uh, in different uh, in poses and postures. So those postures are different. For example, in the beginning, uh, the, 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 the prayer starts uh, with raising hands to the ears, ears and then, uh, I mean, the whole congregation, the imam standing uh, in the front, the whole congregation stands and prays, prays in, in, one, in one way. And the next posture comes uh, when the whole uh, congregation uh, bows before uh, God Almighty. And in, and, and, and in the third uh, posture, the whole congregation goes into prostration. So the first reason is that that a woman standing in, in, in the front and uh, doing all the, going through all those postures uh, might look a little uh, uh, bad for, for that woman as well, I mean, standing be before all the congregation and going through all those postures. So for that reason, a woman is not the, made the imam in case when men are behind, behind her in the congregation. Uh, probably, uh, uh, but if the congregation is, uh, I mean, consists of all women, a woman can be the imam of that con congregation. Uh, the same applies to the reform movement, very similar to the liberal movement, which has a synagogue in, Ed in Glasgow, and for about 10 years now, they have had a woman rabbi, Rabbi Nancy Morris, who was the first woman rabbi in Scotland. Uh, this development hasn't yet happened in Orthodox Judaism, although there are some moves towards it, but that's still at the very, very beginnings, and not in the UK, it's in other parts of the Jewish world for women to serve in Orthodox communities. Uh, it's still quite a long time, I think, before that will become widespread, but certainly uh, our liberal teaching uh, is, is the absolute absolute equality in every respect, economically, religiously, and so forth, of men and women. I want to ask that the people who have been in the past, I don't think the person has been in the past. The person who has been in the past, he has been in the past. So, this is a very difficult thing. For it to stop Islam, और क्रिश्चियनिटी और यहूद यहूदी मज़हब में क्या कानून बनाए हैं क्या कमानी बनाए हैं ये पूछना चाहता हूँ the questioner is asking basically about that most of the wars in the world have not been based on religious grounds but rather for personal gains and uh, the questioner is trying to ask that how we can deal with economic terrorism and what is the response of Judaism, Christianity and Islam regarding that. Um, since the end of the Cold War, there has been a shift in the causes of wars or, or the range of factors uh, causing wars. Now, of course, economic factors and political factors are, remain extremely important. But more than half of the wars <coughs> since, the end of the, since the fall of the Berlin Wall have had a religious dimension, unfortunately. If you think of the wars in the, in the former Yugoslavia, 
with, with Roman Catholicism, with Islam, and with um, orthodoxy on different sides, exacerbating the conflict, not because these religions were saying, we must fight for our faiths, but because the religions were identified with particular communities. The Serbs with orthodoxy, the Croats with Catholicism, uh, and, and the Bosnians majority with Islam. If you think of the, the wars in the Caucasus with the collapse of the USSR, um, these have been fueled by um, conflict between Islam and Christianity, with the Eastern Christianity, not because they're saying we are fighting for these religions, though some extremists would, I do say that, but because the, the nationalistic and geopolitical issues were sharpened by issues of identity focused upon religion. Whether well, you think of um, the, the conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia, uh, Muslim Azerbaijan and Christian Armenia, or, or some of the conflicts in the Central Asian states between different wings of Islam uh, fighting, supporting different factions in civil wars. Now, it also must be said that religion was a factor in the um, much to be regretted, to put it mildly, the catastrophic uh, I Iraq war. Now, we had this extraordinary, here my politics become very clear, I'm afraid, we had the extraordinary spectacle of both President Bush and Prime Minister Blair, both convinced Christians, saying they believe God had told them to invade Iraq. However, His Holiness the Pope, Pope John Paul II, was absolutely sure that God didn't want to have any invasion of Iraq. <laughs> and I ask you to conclude, who had the better communication with God, whether it was the President and Prime Minister, was His Holiness the Pope. Now, both were, mis the, 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 the politicians were misusing religion and tragically, on the Western side, there were those um, Christian evangelical fundamentalists in America who saw the Iraq war as an opportunity to open up a predominantly Islamic area to uh, their own missionary enterprise, a very, very false notion with, with very tragic consequences. So religion has not caused wars over the last 20 years. It has tragically been a, a, a contributory factor and the answer to this must be, in the world religious leaders that have done, but continue to be today, religion must never be used for the purposes of violence, must always be used for the purposes of healing. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I agree completely with what Brian has said. I would only add that one of the ways we can help to do this is by strongly supporting the idea and the ideal of liberal secular democracy that as long as religion is allowed to infect politics, uh, you're going to get these problems because people will misuse religion and will make conflicts sharper because they will preach that they are fighting in the name of God, which, as was said before, is a blasphemy of the name of God. Keep religion out of politics uh, everywhere, and we won't see the end of conflict, human beings being what they are, but we might see a gradual diminution. We know the, the oft-quoted principle that democracies don't go to war against one another is not quite always true, but it's almost always true. If we can promote the ideal of democracy, where government has nothing to do with religion, religion becomes a matter for religious communities, but does not infect the politics of states, then we might go a little way towards solving this problem. Uh, greed and uh, lust for for having what some, somebody else actually possess is one major factor um, which is involved in, in, in modern war warfare. Uh, and uh, the Holy Quran is, uh, has given very clear injunctions regarding this and it states very clearly that La tamuddunna aynaika ilama mattana bihim azwajahum uh, the translation goes that uh, God Almighty says to everyone that extend not your eyes uh, with greed on what we have given to others and be content with what we have given you. So if we observe this, this golden principle and, uh, and always be content with what God has given us and we do not look with, uh, with greed over what God has given to others or to other nations. Probably, yes, we can eliminate wars by observing this golden teaching given by, by the Holy Quran. Thank you. If, if I understood my friend the rabbi rightly, he used the word infect. Infect is a very negative 
has a very negative con connotation. And it was right, we do not want to have liberal to secular democracies infected by the wrong kind of religion. However, I hope that what he was saying does not exclude the role of religious forces in helping to shape uh, political ideas. Because I do not think that one should regard liberal secular democracy as the highest form of uh, civilizational political life. I agree that religious voices, along with all other voices, should be heard and the positive values that other people can assent to. You know, if, if anyone in a, the secular society hears you or you speaking, they'll say, yes, they're beautiful principles and we can agree to them on a purely civil level. And I think that is, so there is ultimately a civil democratic test of what sort of religious voices should be allowed to play a part in the civic debate. Mm, thank you. But I agree that spirituality is important in forming our, our moral and ethical values in society. Sorry, I need to take you back to the same question and based on what the panel has uh, answered there. Um, Rabbi um, Mark Solomon, I don't know whether I didn't really hear you correctly, but I, I, thought, I heard you say that there is a new rabbi in Scotland is that not a way of uh, deviating from the scriptures? Um, I mean, I'm just asking a question. I could be wrong there because as far as I know, it looks as if from the whole scriptures, there ain't any prophetess or any kind of, I mean, priest, woman from the whole scriptures. I don't know whether there's anything that you can quote to correct me here. Thank you. Well, I, I said that uh, there is a, a woman rabbi in Scotland. She's not new. She's been here for, I think, about 10 years, Gillian, correct me, in Glasgow. So this isn't new. There have been women rabbis already for many, many years uh, within liberal and reform Judaism. Uh, of course, there are no rabbis in the Bible at all. So the Bible says nothing about rabbis. In the Bible, there are priests. And it's true, the ancient priests were all men. Uh, but we no longer have priests. The temple was destroyed 2,000 years ago, and we haven't had priests ever since. So priests are not relevant to Judaism nowadays. Uh, prophets, uh, according, according to tradition, there were many female prophets in the Bible. Uh, we, are, we have seven uh, named prophetesses, including uh, Sarah, the wife of Ibrahim, yeah, uh, including Deborah, the judge, and a number of others. Miriam, the sister of Moses, was a prophet. So, so the Talmud speaks of seven prophetesses, but uh, the Talmud also says that there were many, as one of our speakers said about the Islamic tradition, uh, or was it the Baha'i tradition, there are many other uh, prophets and prophetesses whose names haven't come down to us. The Talmud says 144,000 uh, half men and half women who were prophets. So the idea of women having inspiration from God uh, and speaking words of truth and of guidance is certainly nothing new. And we should embrace it in our world today. Domestic violence, I also, you know, as you mentioned, is uh, alcohol, taking of alcohol and intoxicating drugs. Uh, and I would like to ask every representatives of all the religions here to uh, further elaborate the exact teaching of uh, what their Bible or you know, gospel or whatever and all the Baha'i teaching and Islamic Quranic teaching says about whether are they allowed to take alcohol or not, or intoxicating drugs or not, and to what extent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the very, the very short answer is Judaism permits the drinking of alcohol, but only in moderation. So getting drunk is, 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 is forbidden, except there is one day in the year, one festival, when the Talmud says that a person should get so drunk that they no longer know the difference between uh, blessed be Mordechai and cursed be Haman. These are the hero and the villain of the story of Esther, Queen Esther in the Bible. Um, now there are different interpretations. Some people take it very literally. And, you know, uh, some people, some rabbis say it means you should drink just enough to go to sleep and then you don't know the difference anymore. But and there are some who say it means spiritual 
spiritually. There are times when, uh, in a mystical sense, one transcends all distinctions uh, in the presence of God between the hero and the villain, uh, and, and one recognizes the ultimate unity of all. So that's a mystical interpretation. But in practice, it means we have a little more to drink than usual. But on an everyday basis, all of our, when we have the Sabbath, our weekly holy day, and all of our festivals, we bless the holiness of the day over a cup of wine. And the wine is a symbol of joy. Uh, and we see it as a gift of God to celebrate the joy of the Sabbath and the festivals. But it's not, not supposed to get drunk. It's just to have one glass, a sip of wine, and, and to enjoy that pleasure. Um, as for other drugs, the, the, the basic teaching of Judaism is it's forbidden to harm yourself, to injure yourself. God has given us our life and our health, and it's forbidden for us to do anything intentionally to harm ourselves. Um, and this is derived from some verses in the Bible where it says, you should make a parapet around the uh, roof of your house. They had flat roofs in the in ancient times in the Middle East should make a parapet so that nobody can fall off and and God forbid be killed and so this is interpreted by the rabbis to mean in every part of your life you must take precautions not to cause injury uh, to yourself or to others and that is includes uh, taking sort of harmful drugs that will will cause uh, will cause accidents will cause harm so this is the basic teaching I hope that's helpful uh, the, the Apostle Paul, who was both a Jew and a Roman citizen, um, is recorded as uh, giving some advice, take a little wine for the stomach, stomach's sake. So he saw wine as, as a part of a, a healing ministry. And of course, more seriously, uh, wine is at the center of Christian liturgy for most Christian traditions, in that at the Holy Communion or the Eucharist, a uh, Christian will take wine um, as symbolic of the blood of Christ, and for the Catholics, under transubstantiation doctrine, does in fact become uh, the, the, the blood of Christ at the Eucharist. So there is no ban on alcohol, but there is obviously um, the injunction to moderation. The Apostle Paul also said, honor your body, it is the temple of God, therefore do nothing to dishonor your body. I would say that in modern times, certain Christian traditions have been uh, traditions of abstinence from alcohol, particularly the Methodist tradition, the Salvation Army, and generally, I think, across the churches, um, certainly the free, so-called free church, not in Scotland, the free church of England, as is Baptist, Methodist, Congregationalists, um, they, they would strongly emphasize moderation and a, a very limited use of alcohol. Yes, thank you. Uh, the Holy Quran is actually very categorical in this regard and it uh, prohibits the use of alcohol in any way. It states uh, in, in emphatic words that um, and uh, including some other factors. Uh, yes, uh, it states very clearly that khamrun, um, that is uh, wine, is uh, is some is is a filth, and do not go near to it. And it states that uh, the the alcoholic drinks are min amale shaitan. Uh, they are from the deeds of Satan. So do not go near to them in any way. And the Holy Prophet of Islam has very clearly stated in this regard that uh, whatever ma askara kalilohu fakasirohu haramun that if something is, is in, intoxicant to a very little extent, extent um, uh, sorry, uh, if something in, is in, intoxicant, if it is taken in large quantities, even the, the, the little quantity of that thing is, is haram or unlawful according to the teachings of Islam. So the Holy Quran has uh, presented a contrary view to um, Judaism or Christianity. Thank you very much. Thank you. So in the Baha'i faith also there, is, there are actually two interpretations of, the, uh, of this concept of wine. And in the most holy book of the Baha'i revelation, in, in keeping with um, most of the other traditions, the drinking of any intoxicants that cloud the mind, including drugs and consumption of those is prohibited. Baha'u'llah says that, um, he says, it is not for man who has been endowed with reason to consume that which taketh it away.
because that is a distinguishing feature really between us and the the other creatures is that we have reason and uh, the um, intoxicants that cloud the mind mind altering drugs or drinks um, are also categorically therefore forbidden in the in the Baha'i faith on the other hand Baha'u'llah gives an alternative view of wine and in fact in the same holy book which is the most important um, scripture of the Baha'i faith Baha'u'llah says think not that we have revealed unto you a mere code of laws so don't think that I've just given a whole set of do's and don'ts and you're allowed this and you're not allowed that and you, you may and you may not and this is forbidden, this is allowed. No. He says, think not that we have revealed unto you a mere code of laws. Nay, rather, we have unsealed the choice wine with the fingers of might and power. And then he says, holy is the ecstasy of, uh, is the holy ecstasy if you're going to drink of this wine. Whoever has tasted of this wine, which is the celestial wine, which is the teachings, if you like, the divine teachings, then he says he will not barter it for all the treasures of the earth. So this feeling of high on uh, the divine teachings, if you become conscious of the divine teachings, is, I understand, what is actually intended. My, the Baha'i point, point of view is that um, this is what is intended also in the religions of the past about wine, that it was a metaphorical um, wine that is to create this ecstasy of feeling really high, much higher than any wine sort of molecular C2H5OH, you know, the alcohol or other intoxicants could give to you. And that is the wine of the love of God, the wine of the consciousness and the knowledge of God and his manifestation and his teachings. Okay. Perhaps not in the interest of balance, but my experience of living in the Middle East with many Egyptian friends and family, and many Saudi friends and family too, the um, injunction against alcohol doesn't necessarily always work with brown paper bags and bottles at the bottom of many a table when we were invited to Saudi evenings. Mm. I think I would go with the doctor again that it's not so much a prohibition or for or against, but it's the value of life and how you value yourself. And on that emphasis, it is, it is important uh, from a spiritual point of view, from a person's choice rather than prohibition, because certainly prohibition in practice did not work in my experience in Cairo. Um, and living in Belfast as a theological student and a f sharing a flat with a colleague who struggled with alcohol, and I use the word struggled, for one week he was sober and praising the Lord, the second week he would be drunk and miserable. Mm -hmm. And until we get and released from the problem of alcohol, we will get nowhere. Okay. And you. our faiths need to teach us how we can be released and not ordered to do either. Mm. You understand what I'm trying to say? No, they're exactly, you. as you know, has been mentioned, the faith, Islam tells you that uh, there are advantages of alcohol, but ad disadvantages are more. So harms are more than the benefits. So that is the criteria. If a person thinks that it is, now the more harms are, you know, affecting my life, then uh, obviously, uh, you know, uh, he should understand the philosophy behind this decision. And uh, he, by nature, human beings are weak. And as I uh, mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, with my pharmacist, we were discussing, and he said that we only drink in moderation. But in life, moderation only work if the things are normal. In abnormal circumstances and uh, in situations, then, uh, you know, this doesn't work. So perhaps that is the reason that the God Almighty, it was not, uh, you know, uh, banned in the beginning when the Islam started. With the passage of time, then the commandment came. And then it said that because it has got more harms, it's not allowed. So in that situation, now it is only allowed to a Muslim if the doctor prescribes him for some medical reason. And uh, that, that, that is, uh, you know, uh, justifiable and it's not uh, haram for, you know, uh, if, if it is on prescription, as a, like prescription drug. Uh, I am very thankful to the president of our, uh, uh, you know, the uh, Ahmadiyya community at Edinburgh, Mr. Tahmur Malik, that uh, he has, uh, you know, wonderfully organized this event. And uh, I really thank uh, to him and his team. Similarly, uh, I am also thankful to Chief Inspector Gavin Phillips that he has, uh, you know, taken time off and joined us on this, uh, you know, the evening, afternoon rather. And uh, Dr. Tahiri, 
Her presentation was uh, wonderful, and uh, this is the first time uh, you know I have uh, personally heard in uh, detail something from a Baha'i you know presentation. So I learned a lot uh, from your presentation, and uh, similarly, I hope the other uh, you know the members who are present here uh, they have uh, benefited. I am also thankful to Rabbi Mark Solomon, his liberal views. And uh, next time, perhaps, uh, we will, uh, you know, invite uh, your uh, other counterparts to hear, uh, you know, what, what they say. Because the purpose, purpose is to unite the communities. We, 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 we may have different views, different beliefs, but in the uh, presence of those views, they should not bar us to unite together. When it comes to live in harmony and peace, and uh, we should be, you know, capable of, uh, you know, achieving that, uh, and that is the purpose of this conference. Similarly, similarly, <laughs> Reverend, Reverend uh, uh, Brian Cooper has uh, very capably participated and presented the viewpoint from the Christian, uh, you know, view, and uh, I'm very thankful for him that uh, he has uh, effectively, you know, uh, discharged his uh, responsibility, and. Guest speaker, uh, which uh, you know, uh, traveled from London 400 miles, uh, Malana Ataul Momin Sahib. I am also thankful to him that uh, he specially came and uh, you know uh, addressed this meeting and presented the viewpoint of the Islam and Ahmadiyya community. And above all, you know, all the participants, uh, uh, I am all, uh, thankful all of you that uh, you have uh, decided to come and join us and strengthen the, you know, the feeling which we create within the communities. If, uh, you know, that is materialized, uh, and this is a step, you know, because we, our Ahmadiyya community is not holding these conferences uh, just, you know, occasionally. We have got uh, this program of holding these peace conferences throughout the world. Yesterday, in Scotland, we were holding the similar conference in Johnston, near Paisley. Previously, in Scotland, we, have, uh, we were holding the conferences in Lenzi, Kirkintalach, Kilsyth area, and Straven is also, you know, not far from here. We, you know, started uh, the first peace conference in, from Straven. So, so, so this, this, this is, a, you know, a, a concept on which we are working and we hope that the other communities and the sections of the, commu uh, you know, the uh, communities, they will also, you know, take a, a, a effective role, you know, in this and organizing the similar type of events and the Ahmadiyya community will be always there if they in in invite us in these meetings. So thank you very much again and uh, before we uh, conclude this meeting, this is the tradition of the Ahmadiyya community that we, because we do not just uh, talk about the peace, we also pray for the peace. So we end today's meeting with a silent prayer and I request uh, our regional missionary Maulana uh, uh, Sahib to you know lead us in the you know the silent prayer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much.